it helps when you unmute yourself before starting to talk. First, first IT glitch of the day. Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Sean Ferrari. I'm the vice president here at Currency Research, also the co-chair of the Banknote and Currency Conference, uh, which is coming up in February. Um, I'm joined by my co-host of the event, who's also muted right now before you try to talk, Michael. Unmute yourself. Um, <laughs> there we go. <laughs> uh, my co-host of the event, uh, Mr. Michael Lambert. Uh, good morning, sir. Good morning, everyone. Or an afternoon to some, or evening to others. So. <laughs> That's right. We are definitely all over all over the world here. So thanks for joining us on LinkedIn Live. And we are um, excited to spend the next hour, hour and a half with you uh, talking about all the, the happenings in the, in the currency and, and cash cycle. Um, we've got a great lineup of folks. Um, before we, we jump into that, I do want to just, um, as you saw on the video that just played, thank our, our sponsors for the event. Um, things, if, if people are wondering uh, how the, the conference is progressing uh, for next February, things are looking very, very good. Um, we've got a, a great agenda taking shape, and we'll be finalizing that in the coming weeks. Uh, we've got a fantastic list of sponsors ready ready to go. I'm really excited to get people back together in, in February and bring the industry uh, back to, to one place to network and mingle and hear everything that's going on. So Michael and I are, are thrilled to be bringing that program to you. And we're, we're very much looking forward to that in, in Washington in February. Um, and just before that, uh, we've in, at the end of this year, just be on the lookout. You'll also see we've got a couple of cash cycle seminars, uh, one in Amsterdam for the EMEA region and one in San Diego for the Americas. And we hope you can join us there as well. So without further ado, um, I want to get get the show kicked off here. The way this will will run today, uh, we've got a great starting panel um, where we'll hear about cash trends and what's happened with COVID, uh, what's going on in the retail sector, and then what's kind of a, a, a good strategy going forward. So we have uh, Ashley Yayak from Walmart who will talk a bit about what's going on with Walmart and start us off, and and after Ashley. Uh, we'll hear from Alex Bow at the Fed and Joseph Verana at the ECB. Um, while we are having this discussion, uh, please feel free to ask questions. Um, you'll see in the LinkedIn area, there's a spot to chat. Uh, please do so, and we will we'll see those questions on our end and try to address as many of them as we go, go forward. Um, we'll probably uh, hear from Ashley, Joseph, and Alex, and then kind of address those questions as a group. Um, before we move on to hearing from uh, Jeannie uh, with IACA and uh, Donald with Banknote Industry News. And that will wrap the day. Um, but to start, um, without further ado, let's hear about what's going on with, with cash and payments and, and COVID and everything going on with Walmart. So Ashley, I'll, I'll turn it to you to, to introduce your, yourself <laughs> and, and take it away from there a little bit. Awesome. Great. Thanks, Sean. Hi, everyone. Good morning. Good afternoon. Um, thanks for having me. So Ashley Ayak, I lead the Treasury Operations Team with Walmart. Uh, so we're responsible really for all things related to cash and check processing within our stores. Uh, we partner very closely with our banks and carriers. Um, as well as our internal technology operations and asset protection teams to really drive efficiencies um, and cost savings for our stores and clubs. So it's definitely been an interesting year um, in the cash ecosystem. As I started preparing for this and sort of outlining, you know, the things I wanted to cover, it was really shocking, um, sort of the cash events that we've uh, managed and survived over the last 16 to 18 months. Um, when I think of kind of the beginning of the pandemic, um, you know, we were we were into our normal sort of tax uh, tax refund check cashing season. Um, it, it was a fairly normal season, but we were starting to hear, um, you know, the rumblings of of the pandemic expanding, of COVID expanding, of some closures. Um, and so, as you know, as we were sort of winding down that season, we were facing panic buying, um, a big shift to online grocery pickup and delivery. Our stores, you know, we were doing one way in, one way out, ticketing to make sure that we could keep, you know, customers socially distanced. Um, and that really required a different sort of cash support than what we would do, you know, in during tax season, which really requires, um, you know, larger denominations, the panic buying really supported smaller denominations. And so logistically, 
um, you know, trying to wind down one season while we're sort of facing another um, proved to be a bit of a challenge. Uh, we also saw unemployment skyrocketing, which, you know, created a big shift um, to EB, EBT, uh, which is predominantly card. Um, and so all of that kind of contributed to a decline in our cash sales and, can, and cash transactions um, in spring and early summer of last year. We also started hearing around the same time that the discussions of EIP payments um, and sort of what we fondly call um, or call stimulus round one. Um, and, you know, we didn't have a playbook for a stimulus. Um, we didn't know, you know, the income levels kept changing. We didn't know where we would see those cards, those checks. We didn't really know the mix between um, direct deposit and checks. And so, you know, we worked relentlessly internally to try to figure out what we could do to support the stores to make sure that we could get the customers um, the cash that they needed, knowing how important um, these payments were given sort of the state of the economy. Um, and, you know, once we did have a plan, we had a very short timeline to execute, which again, you know, posed some logistical challenges. We were trying to get significant amounts of cash into areas where, you know, we typically hadn't um, needed it. And, you know, looking back, we, we probably didn't in some of those areas, but obviously um, hindsight's 2020 and we use that knowledge um, on the future rounds of stimulus. Um, so as, as we um, were supporting the stores through that, we found ourselves in um, a coin shortage, which I, I have to make sure I call out that it's not actually a shortage. Um, it's a circulation challenge. Um, you know, the Fed announced that it was going to be allocating coin, which was somewhat shocking. Uh, I think we had never really worried about coin. Um, coin had always just showed up and we used it to make change and that was it. So um, almost immediately after the announcement, we started seeing our orders significantly shorted. Um, that's a big challenge for our associates, for customers. Um, and, and given we hadn't faced it before, we really had to think of creative ways to support the stores, um, whether that be, you know, pushing all the to one or two manned registers, putting our SCOs in card only mode. Um, and, and honestly, that was probably the biggest challenge um, of the year because it, it, again, hadn't faced it, didn't know when it was gonna end. Terrible customer experience for those, you know, that, that wanna use cash at a self checkout. Um, and, and some of those challenges we're, we're continuing to face today. Um, on top of that, all of that, we also had a record hurricane season last year. We had five category four storms um, that impacted various parts of the country. That's a cash event for us because we, a lot of times we see store closures, we see road closures, um, but at the same time, we have all of these consumers that are trying to buy um, the staples, the necessities. It shifts business from one city to another, potentially. Um, we, a lot of times we'll see electricity down, our POS systems down, which then shifts consumers to pay with cash. Um, but with road closures, how do we make sure they have their cash? Um, so those were those were a challenge as well. Um, and then, you know, earlier this year, we had a couple more rounds of stimulus, which, you know, we were able to leverage the knowledge we learned um, last year to get through those. Um, and then now we have seen the um, the coin shortage reemerge. So I don't know if we can get that hashtag coin, get coin moving banner flowing again, but um, this is my plug coin. It's a circulation challenge. If you've got coins sitting in your homes and jars um, in your cup holders, take it to your local Walmart, take it to your local bank. Let's get that moving. There's a significant amount of consumers that want to pay with cash that prefer to pay with cash, not just that they have to. Um, and it's important for us to be able to take care of them as well. Um, and then now we're, um, we're currently monitoring the child tax credit, um, which brings us up to basically now. Um, I think those checks and payments went out um, last week. We are monitoring you know, the caching within our stores, 
to, to make sure that we've we've got enough where we need it. Um, and then that will give us a playbook for that um, for the rest of the year. So um, I'm hoping for a little uh, cash stability and maybe a little event downtime. Um, but with that, it, it's 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 been an interesting year. We've learned a lot. Um, and I think um, we'll all come out with with a better a better view um, holistically of, of the cash ecosystem going forward. So, Sean, I'll turn it back to you. Oh, hello. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> Hi. Well, thank you, Ashley. That was sure. you know, it's fascinating. It's always interesting to hear uh, what's actually happening out out in the economy. Um, and Walmart, with your footprint, is obviously all all over the place um, and can really kind of shed a light on on some of that. Um, you mentioned this a little bit, uh, but maybe just just a, another question on kind of the mix between you know cash and and digital payments and that sort of thing. Have have you seen any shifts in that on your end, or uh, just a few word, a few more words on that? Maybe. Sure, sure. So um, when we saw the unemployment really skyrocket and the the government benefits increase, that there's been that big shift to EBT. We also saw a lot of people wanting contactless payments, right? Which again, lends away from cash. Um, as we've gone through the pandemic, um, we are seeing our cash transactions come back a little bit and our cash sales come back a little bit. Um, I think that the big thing we're watching is those those EBT payments. If you know those consumers that are, are using that, um, are using that benefit, go back to work. Do they go back to a payroll check that they then come cash and use like we think they used to, or have they permanently converted to sort of an electronic payment um, form of payment? So that's something we're watching pretty closely. Um, but we know there's there's still a significant portion of consumers that just want to, um, not have to, but want to um, use cash. And so I think they will continue um, to support us there. And we'll support them. Yeah, yeah that, that makes a lot of sense. Um, I think the other the other question I just had from a um, and you guys have been using kind of uh, large scale or medium size kind of recycling equipment and in store mm -hmm. kind of catch automation for a while. Um, just any any thoughts on that overall? I'm sure we have a couple folks out there in that space that might be yes, that. <laughs> sure. So. Um, Obviously, the, the data and the analytics that we get from those devices helps us tremendously when we're planning um, and then also managing the levels of cash within our stores. So we can pull those. We can pull certain levels in certain regions at the store level. Um, and so that helps us move a little bit quicker um, when we are trying to accommodate for a stimulus um, or even um, a coin a coin shortage. Um, we've got the data to really support the decisions that we're making. Um, in other areas, it, it can be not necessarily a challenge, but it's a different concern. So when we talk about some of the civil unrest that we saw um, within our stores, when we talk about hurricanes, that puts a different, um, a different concern on the recycler, making sure um, they're not exactly waterproof. So when the sprinklers go off or there's flooding, um, or there's damage done to the stores, that poses a different challenge, all of which we faced this past year. <laughs> yeah, as you yes. said, it definitely was not a uh, smooth year by any no. stretch of the imagination for anybody. But <laughs> Yeah, I, I really, um, I tried to give as much detail as I could in a short amount of time, but I think really all of those events could be their own, <laughs> could be their own <laughs> webinar, it seems like. Yeah, definitely. And uh, we will have Ashley in, in San Diego um, this this November or December, sorry, this December, um, where she can dig into some more of these these details. So we're looking forward sure. to that. Um, I do see one other, other other question from Jeannie on the side here a little bit. You mentioned the the stimulus payments. Um, just any any more detail on that? Was it a, a big pop that you sure. saw or what? Just a few more words on that. Yeah, absolutely. So that's a great question. The first round of stimulus, we really, um, it, it seemed to us like the consumers were cashing their their checks or cards, but they were then paying their bills with them, um, which was, you know, we didn't we didn't really know. So um, we didn't see that come back through the stores like we would typically with a tax season cash refund. Um, so it did feel like the consumers were taking that for necessities, bill paying, et cetera. 
Um, the rounds two and three, a little bit different. We did see more of an uptick in, um, in cash sales and cash transactions um, for those rounds. Cool. Sounds good. So we'll probably come back with a few more questions for you uh, after the, the panel. Um, but thank you for that. And uh, very interesting. And now uh, we're going to switch over to Alex uh, with the Fed Cash Product Office. Alex, how you doing? <laughs> Great, Sean. Hello, everyone. Good. Thank you for taking some time. We look forward to hearing an update on the, the Diary of Consumer Payment Choice and, and where that stands. So I'll, I'll turn it over to you. Sounds good. Great. My presentation is up. Hello, everyone. It's good to be here with all of you today. Uh, as Sean mentioned, my name is Alex Bao, and I am the vice president of the data and policy analysis team within the Federal Reserve's cash product office. For those of you that are not familiar with my group, we perform research into how cash is being used here in the U.S., how that um, usage might be evolving over time, and then how this cash supply chain is evolving also to meet those needs over time. So today, as Sean mentioned, I'd like to share a bit about what we're seeing with cash trends uh, from our latest diary of consumer payment choice, which collected data from October of 2020, as well as a supplemental survey that we fielded in April of this year. And by the way, I did like that get coin moving ticker that Ashley had. So feel free to add it to my feed anytime if, uh, if uh, it is available. So um, on the next slide, perfect, thank you. So today I'm going to touch on three areas for discussion and update on some of the high level cash trends that we are observing here in the US as we begin to recover from the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, we'll then dig into the data from our latest diary and supplemental survey. And then finally, since I am from the Federal Reserve, I will touch briefly on how this relates to our Fed cash mission. So going to the, the next slide and actually one more. Um, thanks, Sean. So as background, uh, it's useful to describe the payment system in the U.S. just as, a, as at a very high level, where we have 332 million residents, approximately, uh, making about 230 billion payments annually, of which we at least used to estimate 70 billion were in cash. Um, those are pre-pandemic numbers. We've been a little bit hesitant to update this just given the continued uncertainty um, about how much of that may hold versus how much may uh, return to some previous numbers. Um, but as you will see in later slides, this number would be changed if we did use our October 2020 payment data. Um, for now, we'll leave it here, but you'll probably see this updated over time, especially as we get a sense of just how consumers' payment preferences have shifted and, and um, how that might look over the long term. In the green area, you see uh, what the banking industry looks like in the U.S. Uh, we do service approximately 11,000 financial institutions. And there are about a half million ATMs in the US. Those financial institutions in turn receive financial services from the Federal Reserve System, which is a, a network of 12 Federal Reserve Bank districts that have a footprint of 28 banks and branches across the country. In those Federal Reserve branches, we process about 33 billion notes on our high speed sorting equipment each year. Going to the next slide. Um, this still looks at what's happening in the U.S. at a very high level. Um, one way that we look at demand for cash is um, with currency in circulation. And that's what you see here on this chart. Many of you have likely seen this in the past. Um, and it is very interesting just to see that very significant spike up once the pandemic hit and shelter in place uh, edicts went into place. Um, as of now, we stand at about 2.2 trillion worldwide of U.S. currency in circulation. And you see here that on the chart, we actually break this out into volume, into billions of notes and by uh, denomination categories. So we have the lower denominations in gray at the bottom, the medium denominations in light blue, and then the higher denominations in dark blue. And a couple of things I'll, I'll mention here. Um, it is interesting to see that all denominations have increased in terms of, of uh, currency in circulation. But what you can see in the chart um, is that most of the increase was a result of increased 20s, 50s, and 100s, suggesting that cash is being used in, as a store of value versus um, transactional. And uh, I think this touches on, on what Ashley mentioned, um, as well as what you don't see in the chart, which is our volumes. So even though every denomination went up, that's on a, a net basis, right? So we pay out 
more than we receive back, then currency in circulation will go up. And really, when we look at the lower denoms, uh, we did see that the, it did increase on a net basis. But really, on our side, we saw both receipts and orders for uh, ones through fives uh, decline. It's just that the receipts declined faster than the, the order volume. Going to the next slide. Another way to think about CIC is where it's being um, held or where it's being used. And we thought that this might be an, an interesting chart to share with the, the, the audience today. What you see here is how much uh, financial institutions or depository institutions are holding in their vaults with cash. And you can see here, we did include what that looked like before the pandemic really hit where um, before the pandemic, they were holding about 62 billion in their cash vaults. Once the, the shelter in place orders went into effect, you see that that really increased to a high of 95 billion. And we're still sitting around 80 to 85 billion um, when we, we take a look at it at the aggregate level. And really, you know, what this speaks to, I think, is a few different things. Obviously, the, the pandemic had a lot of uncertainty. So during times of uncertainty, it makes sense to hold a little bit of cash just in case, and, and that holds true for, for banks as well. In addition, um, there were the stimulus efforts that Ashley mentioned, and naturally uh, banks did want to prepare to, to meet the demand for that across the country. Going to the next slide. Um, what we hear, have here um, is now we're, we're digging into what happened with the diary data. And so now we're zooming into the ground level. And as we, as we just were talking about with what we're seeing with the bank holdings, um, we also see that with consumer holdings. And that's what you see here. We have a couple different ways that we measure cash holdings at the consumer level within the diary. On the left, you see how much consumers are holding with um, their purse or wallet. And then on the right, you see how much consumers are holding in their household. So whether that's a, a, a safe or a drawer or the proverbial mattress, um, you can see that there, there's a couple different stories here. On the left hand, uh, you see that consumers are roughly holding about the same amount in their purse or wallet. And, and that's probably not too surprising. Uh, cash is generally a, a contingent or a back backup payment instrument in case a, a card or another payment uh, method is not accepted or uh, the payment network is down. And it's likely that even though consumers didn't have many opportunities to use cash during the, 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 the main part of the lockdown, um, it didn't necessarily mean that they changed just how much cash was sitting in their, their purse or wallet. On the other hand, if you take a look on the right side, you see how much consumers were reporting holding in their households. And not too surprisingly, that did increase. Um, and you do see a similar story as to the, the amount that they were holding and when they started holding more, as we did see with the, the bank. So as uh, the pandemic started and the lockdown started to take effect, consumers held more. And as uncertainty increased or maintained, uh, they, they still held on to that amount. Uh, this is going to be something that we're going to continue to, to watch and monitor. Um, as you can see, it did increase all the way through April. And the question is also what happens when the economy returns to whatever normal looks like in the future. Going to the next slide, um, here you'll see the high level breakdown of payment types that uh, consumers used in the latest diary. So you'll see here that we have the last few diaries. Uh, so that would be October, 2018, October, 2019, and then October, 2020, which is really the first one we had since the, the pandemic hit. And it was interesting to take a look at how cash as a, a share of total transactions that consumers reported stayed about steady at 26% before the pandemic to the relatively uh, strong decline in 2020. Again, this isn't necessarily surprising. In, in October 2020, there was uh, some level of reopening, but there still was a lot of uh, limitations in how uh, consumers maybe would go out. And given that we had spent so much time in lockdown, it might not be too surprising that uh, they weren't necessarily shopping in the same way as before. The other thing to point out here that we don't have on these charts is just that um, 
as a whole, the average number of transactions that consumers reported did decline as well. So we saw about a five um, transaction decline in how many they they did report. So uh, while cash did decline, the actual number does look potentially a little bit more significant, but you, we do find that this um, percentage breakdown looks um, a little bit more um, relevant when we, when we think about the fact that payments as a whole might have declined. We do see that both credit and debit, or sorry, actually credit really took a, a majority of the, the increase. Uh, debit did decline slightly. Um, and naturally with ACH, uh, that's less about the in-person transactions. Hey, Alex, uh, sorry, you, you muted yourself there or somebody muted you by accident. If you could. <laughs> oh, thank you. There we go. <laughs> um, we Great. lost your Thanks, audio. John. Yep. <laughs> okay, so now as we take a look at uh, payment preference, uh, what we see here as uh, cash as a payment preference also decline um, as consumers shifted their preference to debit and credit cards. Um, and as preferences have been sticky over the years, uh, how they report their preferences in the 2021 diary will be interesting and may shed light on the longer term impact of COVID-19 on payments. Uh, one of my team members, Sean O'Brien, which many of you may have heard from in previous presentations, has done some research into this, the stickiness of payment preferences. And what we see is if a consumer shifts from say uh, cash to credit, it does take a little time for them to actually fully um, move a lot of their transactions over to credit. So. Um, that's where we'll continue to monitor this to see how this, this uh, shakes out over uh, coming diaries. Going to the next slide. Um, here what we look at is we break out the, the transactions um, across age groups and perhaps not too surprisingly, the decline uh, for cash usage did take place across all age groups. And in general, uh, this chart that breaks down the demographics is similar to what you might have seen in the past. As uh, we look at older demographics, they do use more cash versus the younger demographics, other than the 18 to 24 category, since they may have fewer options in, in terms of how they get um, money to pay for things. They may still be getting a lot of um, cash or money from, from friends and family. So uh, they may still need cash as a, as a percentage um, at a higher level versus say once they enter the workforce. Going to the next slide. Um, so here, the main reason uh, that the share of cash usage declined in the diary was really because of fewer small value payments. And that's what we focus on here on this chart. Um, and that's what you see on, on the left here. Uh, we look at the transactions that were under $25. And what you see here is that traditionally that has been a mainstay for cash. Um, and with 2020, that really did significantly decline. Now, it is important to, to just note that people aren't necessarily shopping in the same way as before and that they may have consolidated previous uh, shopping trips from say three or four stops to one or two. And again, that, that question of whether that's a permanent shift in shopping habits or if it is still just a, a remnant of kind of the, the, the stance that we are all in due to the pandemic is still to be determined. It might be somewhere in between, um, but it is obviously something that we're watching. And you can see that um, that also plays out with the average uh, monthly cash spending on, on the right. So we don't really see consumers spending that much less cash. So maybe it was a matter of just consolidating um, trips or um, you know something else that we'll continue to dig into over time. Here, touching on those small value payments a bit more, um, this, this, this decrease in small value payments is also co correlated with a decrease in the share of payments made in person as online shopping increased. So here you can see uh, that we've broken out the, the size of the payment for different merchant categories in the diary on the right. And on the left, uh, you see just how many transactions consumers reported 
have, uh, performing in store versus uh, or in person versus not in person. And this does take out bills since we do know that those are generally speaking electronic. So taking those out to see just what consumers are doing in terms of day-to-day uh, -day shopping gives us that breakdown of uh, not in person in blue and in person in green. And in previous presentations, we had noted that while many of us do see opportunities to shop um, say online, when we look at the nation as a whole, that, that increase in online shopping did happen very slowly until the pandemic. So we do see that big jump in 2020 from 13% online to 20% online. And on the right again, you can see how some of those, uh, those, pay, those purchases um, are broken out between the two years for some of the, the key categories we're, we're going to dig into since we know that many of these may have used or had more opportunities for cash usage in the past, but um, that online options uh, really did pick up with the pandemic. And um, again, whether those those consumers stick with those online options or they go back to in-person shopping is something we're closely watching and analyzing. So going to the next slide, I think I only have a, uh, this might be the, the last one on the, the diary. Um, In-person payments continue to uh, remain well below pre-pandemic levels, uh, which is likely reducing cash use. And what this also exacerbates is that coin continues to circulate at rates well below what we saw before the pandemic. So I'm glad that we still have that, that ticker at the bottom um, moving because we, we do really appreciate everyone's help in, in getting that message out to, to help get the, the circulation patterns back to um, as normal as possible. So what you see here on this slide is uh, the number of consumers that reported having an in-person payment in the last 30 days on the left. And not too surprisingly, there was a, a, a lot of people that would have at least one in-person payment in the last 30 days before the pandemic. There was a big hit during the lockdowns. And while it's rebounded, it hasn't rebounded to the same level as before. So something also just to continue to watch. Um, and this is more of just like a, a helpful gauge of how many people are shopping in person. It obviously does not speak to how many trips or how many shopping events they have during the last 30 days. And as we look at the right, just uh, we do utilize the diary and the survey to uh, get a pulse on how consumers are using coins. Uh, not too surprisingly, it might be lower on the priority list if they are going out shopping um, rather than taking those coins in for redemption. Um, they may be more focused on just what they need to get accomplished during the shopping trip. So finally, um, I'll just touch on this briefly. Um, it wouldn't be a cash product office presentation without at least briefly touching on our Fed cash mission. So I do think it's safe to say that we have seen significant shifts in the way that consumers are paying for goods and services and that we still are in an uncertain time. Uh, between continued news about COVID variants and what the new normal looks like for all of us as our recovery happens at different paces across the nation, we in the Federal Reserve do want to ensure that banks and the public can continue to obtain the cash that they need. Some of these, like the disruption to the coin circulation patterns, are more challenging than others, but we will continue to plan for a range of possible future scenarios and seek to make sure that our operations are flexible, agile, and resilient as possible. And we do this through focusing on those multi-year high priority objectives that you see on the right, and also through our continued partnerships with others in the cash supply chain. So uh, we know that we're not out of the woods yet, and we want to continue to engage with the industry to make sure that at in the end of the day, um, consumers can get access to the cash and coin they need, as well as continue to maintain confidence in the usage of U.S. currency over time. So that's uh, the update. I uh, really do appreciate everyone's time. And let me pause there to see if we have any questions that we wanted to touch on. Sorry, Shona. I, uh, I may want to just, uh, I think um, this might be one of those periods in these diary studies where we have to shift away from consumer preference because uh, quite frankly, there really wasn't an opportunity for, for consumers to have a preference, right? During the pandemic, they couldn't use cash. Even as things began to open up, um, many institutions, I'm sorry, many retailers were not accepting cash, at least in the Washington, D.C. area. Um, and so I think it does, it's not surprising at all what's going on. It'll be interesting to see that that rebound. Um, but I, um, I also wonder, um, as I've uh, 
uh, moved around uh, the region and outside of the region, I've actually seen um, entire malls shut down. Um, I, I, you know, the number of retailers that have gone out of business um, in the you know, in the U.S., for example, does the CPO have any information on that relative to this declining uh, use of cash? Um, and, and Alex, before you answer that, one other thing I'll just throw out there, and I know that a lot of central banks around the world try to get the message out that cash um, presents no particular dangers in terms of using it, although the message I don't, I'm not sure was clearly made in the United States. Um, and I just, I just, I, I'd be interested to hear from other central banks, if not here, hopefully in February when we see everyone face to face, um, you know, their experiences uh, there. But I think it, uh, on the U.S. side, we we weren't really out there with 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 studies and information that we had that suggested that there was no increased, um, uh, you know, risk of of of, of catching uh, COVID nineteen from cash. Um, and I wonder what what effect that had versus other countries. Yeah, definitely. Good, good questions, Michael. Um, so the, with the first question, we aren't necessarily uh, at this time um, trying to tie changes to, say, uh, the, the brick and mortar foot, footprint to cash usage. But we are monitoring different forces that may influence how cash is used over time. Um, a few different things that, that we're thinking about is, you know, the fact that the virus is still a threat. So it discourages many activities, um, such as going to the mall. Um, unemployment is still elevated. Government unemployment benefits um, have been higher um, and will stay, generally speaking, higher through September. Uh, many women have dropped out of the labor force and have not necessarily returned or been able to return because of perhaps childcare concerns or other concerns. Uh, many employees are still working from home and consumer saving is at unprecedented levels. So I do think that you know what you bring up is, is going to fit into that mosaic somehow. Um, I, I think we're still trying to figure out the best way to tell that story without um, saying that, you know, um, if, you know, there are some malls that don't come back, that we're able to tie that specifically to cash volumes quite yet. But yeah, it's definitely um, one of the things that we're, we're thinking about, just how do we fit the, the retail picture into, um, you know, the, the opportunities for consumers to use cash. For the, the second question about um, the messaging around, you um, cash usage and transmiss transmissibility of the virus. Um, I don't have the numbers off the top of my head, but we did ask a little bit about that in the supplemental surveys, and we didn't see um, a, a, um, a, a full on shift for consumers uh, away from cash because of those concerns. But we did, of course, see a little bit of a hit. Um, so I think that the CDC guidance of like continuing to generally wash your hands and over time that concern has um, to a certain level uh, abated, but it, it is uh, something that, at least from the, the survey that we performed, didn't necessarily um, kill people's uh, usage of cash when they could use it. Yeah, and I think my, my point was where they could use it. Just in the Washington area, there were just a number of places that just would not accept it. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, Alex. Maybe just a Couple ones, um, before, a couple additional questions from the audience here before we we move on uh, to Joseph. Um, you know, I know you don't have a crystal ball, uh, but there was a there was a question on. You know, what do you think? Do you think these changes uh, are going to persist or um, return to pre pandemic levels? Any any early signs yet? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, I do wish I had a crystal ball at this time, um, but yeah, it, it's hard to say, right? I mean, I think that uh, what we're trying to do to the extent that we can is really um, get a, a feel from the industry, from, um, you know, partners like like Ashley to just get a sense of, you know, are they seeing cash usage rebound? Uh, and I, I do wish I, I could give some like high level thoughts or guidance, but I mean, I think in general, like it, it wouldn't be necessarily surprising if there was some place in the middle, right? We wouldn't return back to the previous uh, levels of cash usage, but we might not see the same level of acceleration that happened during the lockdown. And as people started to see new options for say getting food delivery um, and say uh, shopping delivered right to their door. So, you know, that's the best that uh, we hear, but to, to the extent of where in that middle area it falls out is still to be determined. So um, I, I do think that some of those other factors that we can't tie directly to cash usage specifically, but will probably influence it, um, are things that we're also trying to, to dig into as well. Okay. Um, 
the other thing too that we're we're looking at is just the idea of like what about uh, consumers' access to cash? So I think it touches a little bit on on Michael's point about um, it's not exactly the same as shopping in person or using cash at a retailer, but it's also can consumers easily get cash? Um, where is the location? Um, do they have to you know really try to um, go out of their way to either get it or deposit it? Um, and does that affect how how they might consider using it too? Great. No, thanks for that. Um, a lot of other questions. There's a couple I'm going to tag to follow up with, I think, both you and Joseph on when we come back, particularly around international wholesale and maybe some counterfeit stuff. Um, but we'll we'll come back to those. Just to address a couple of the other things that have, have come up in the, the chat, thanks for everybody putting the questions up there. I think it, it signals there's a lot of dialogue going on, so it, it clearly there's a lot of interest to talk about this. And uh, you know, we will be digging into a lot of these uh, in our upcoming events too. And I'm, I'm sure Alex will have you on stage in San Diego too, digging into this stuff. Um, particularly, I saw a question about uh, how cannabis has um, maybe affected cash use. We'll have a whole panel on that uh, in December. Um, I don't know if you have any initial thoughts on that. That's kind of a US specific one. Um, if you've looked at that at all, or, or we'll just wait until December and we can dig into it then. <laughs> yeah, I, I think we might want to hold off on, on that until okay. December. Um, yeah, it's a good question. It hasn't been necessarily our focus um, as we've kind of tried to, you know, manage cash demand and planning for meeting that demand across the industry. Um, but yeah, it's a good question. Okay. Um, I also saw a question come up on CBDCs. Um, this isn't really the right the right panel to talk about that, but we love to follow up on that later. And we are adding a whole day onto a separate conference at the end of the Banknote and Currency Conference um, on digital currency. So that would be a great place to, to address that as well. Um, there are also a lot of questions on, will we make the slides available? We just need to confirm with the presenters that, that that's okay. And uh, we'll send out a thank you email with the, with the decks that we can share. Um, all of this is recorded and rewatchable though uh, on LinkedIn and YouTube. So um, you can always replay there as well. Okay, sorry, that was just some housekeeping as we were <laughs> getting some questions in. So thanks, Alex. Uh, we'll bring you back up in a, in a little bit at the end of the, the panel here. Um, let's jump over to Joseph, and he can tell us a bit of the, the European perspective of what's going on uh, from, from the ECB. So Joseph, the uh, virtual floor is yours. Thank you very much, Sean, and hello to everyone. <clears throat> My name is uh, Josef Verana. I'm a senior expert at uh, the ECB's Directorate Banknotes. And I would like to thank you to give me the opportunity to guide you through two topics today. One would be the, let's say, update on the Euro Banknote circulation developments. Also, on the way, it's been affected by the current uh, COVID pandemic. And the second one, to also uh, briefly introduce you to the Cash 2030 strategy which is the strategy that the euro system approved, let's say, where we want to see cash in the next decade. So if we can move on to the next slide, starting with the circulation developments, um, what we can see is, of course, that after a demand uh, surge uh, when the pandemic started around March, April 2020, we still see that we have a significant growth, uh, even when we speak about 2021. Uh, last two months, it reached 8.5% uh, in value terms or 8% in the terms of pieces. And as you can see, also, it is still, uh, let's say, outpacing the growth rates that we have seen before uh, the pandemic has started. So, so still a uh, significant growth rates of the circulation. Uh, moving on to the next one. Um, here, what is also important to say that um, for the development of individual denominations, we've seen uh, really a demand spike for the Euro 200. There are two reasons for that. Um, also, as Alex already said, uh, the pandemic um, basically triggered uh, precautionary motives for holding cash. So there have been a lot of high denominations going out, uh, especially in the first half of 2020. But if you also look uh, at it from a longer perspective, um, the Euro 200 surge is linked to the discontinuation of Euro 500 uh, issuance. So what is clear from the chart is that uh, in the, let's say, following months or maybe next year, we'll probably see that in value terms, the 200, the Euro 200 will outpace the Euro 500 in circulation. Uh, as far as the average uh, note value and circulation is concerned, it's also then um, 
more or less straightforward that the average node value has decreased, especially because of the swap in circulation between the 500 and the 200 uh, banknote. Okay, if we move on to another, to the next slide, one thing is the net issuance increase, but the net issuance as such uh, doesn't tell us about the turnover, meaning how many banknotes we issue to be used uh, in the cash cycle and how many banknotes are returned back to the Eurosystem NCBs. And especially uh, these two slides will focus on that. On this one, we see the evolution of low denominations or transactional denominations, 5, 10, and the 20. And we tried to compare, uh, let's say, the values observed before the corona. Uh, so we took the year 2019 as reference, and we compared the volumes uh, or the value of 5, 10, and 20 gross issuance and returned notes in 2020 and 2021. So what you can see is that the volumes uh, are below those observed in 2019, uh, roughly below by 20%. Uh, as you can see on both sides, so for gross issuance and also for the number of notes returned. Um, so you can also ask the question, okay, I mean, what does it mean? Is this the new normal? Does we Do we see that, let's say, we will have 20% less of transactional notes issued and returned? Um, it's fairly early to say uh, if this is a new normal. I believe it is not because uh, unfortunately due to the current uh, pandemic there are many let's say activities that we used to do before it and that we don't do now especially uh, with cash for example you go out for a coffee you pay for a parking you travel abroad uh, within the euro area and these things have been rather limited recently and we hope that after let's say uh, this pandemic wave is over and we will be able to come back to these activities that we will also see that we will be closer to the situation in 2019. To what extent this will happen, it's very difficult to say, as also Alex pointed out before. Uh, moving on to the next slide, uh, here we basically have the situation for high value denominations, which is Euro 100 and Euro 200 banknote. Situation is slightly different. On the issue or gross issuance side, we see that we have reached almost the same levels as before uh, the COVID pandemic started, as you can see on the left-hand side. Whereas on the right-hand side, we see that the number of high-value notes returned is still below these levels. So this also goes in line with the fact that uh, during, let's say, any shock, any any pandemic or any kind of um, situation you try to seek cash as a safe haven so basically especially in 2020 people withdrew a lot of high denominations for precautionary reasons which are only going back uh, slower <clears throat> so uh, again what is the new normal for high denominations is difficult to say but here at least the difference is a bit uh, lower than for the transactional denominations if we move on to the next slide um, the question is, when we try to really analyze and research uh, at the ECB about the banknote paradox. So basically, we see that um, cashless means of payments are used more and more in, for transactions uh, when doing uh, purchases for goods and services. Yet at the same time, the circulation, the, the cash or banknote circulation is still growing. So why is that? So basically, a colleague of mine, uh, did a paper on this banknote paradox, which uh, I recommend to read to everyone, if not yet done so, where he tried to really analyze, okay, uh, why is that? And what are the different motives for demanding cash and holding cash? And as you can see, <clears throat> the outcome by using different direct and indirect methods is that cash use for transaction only ranges between 20 and 22% on average <clears throat> on the Right hand side, you see 13 and 30, which are really the most upper and most lower um, bounds, uh, with the central estimate around 20%. And then, what is the banknote or your banknote use uh, for the rest? And that is used abroad, basically denoting the international role of euro, which varies between 30 and 50%. And the remaining third part is 
their cash your banknotes are used for store of value not surprising so uh, whenever uh, we think of a banknote paradox and we put cash transactions in relation to card transaction cashless transactions we have to be mindful of different functions of cash and uh, this paper focuses especially on this role so that would be for let's say the topic number one the circulation developments and now moving on to the next slide <clears throat> I would like to introduce you to the main elements of the Eurosystem Cash 2030 strategy so what is it it's the vision of the Eurosystem that the European Central Bank and the NCBs so that in 2030 we will have cash as a available and accepted means of payments used for transactions but as well as recognized again store of value of choice and as you can see on this slide we have five strategic objectives that we would like to really focus on within the strategy and we will go through them in the next slides so the first one is that we always ensure the issuance of cash so whenever there is a demand we are there to ensure that we will supply banknotes in the adequate volumes and quality the second and third go hand in hand we will speak about it in more detail whenever we want to have cash as a viable option of uh, means of payments we have to ensure that people can access it and businesses people and businesses can access it and that we can pay with it so it's ensured that cash is accepted as means of payment the fourth and the fifth go more towards the production side so basically we would like to have with the new banknote series uh, innovative and secure euro banknotes and we of course have to be ready um, to already now thinking about the next series what we what we will need to do there what kind of features we would like to have and so on and the fifth one is health and safety but we will speak about it so moving to the next slide uh, very important especially also in COVID uh, and pandemic uh, times is what do we do in order to ensure access and acceptance of cash so first of all we try to really thoroughly um, analyze the bank's services the bank services meaning if we have enough possibilities to withdraw cash and lodge cash and what are the fees for that so what the businesses and public has to pay for the services not only pay at this point in time but how the fees have developed over time this is important that we have a look at both public and retail or businesses at the same time uh, there was a newly set up working group dealing with this topic of access and acceptance of cash at the level of ERPB which is an abbreviation for European retail and payment board uh, basically a body uh, which brings together the supply and demand side of cash so consumer organization banking association retail so all the important stakeholders in the cash cycle and this group is expected to deliver let's say the stock taken a gap analysis for access and acceptance of cash in November 2021 so in this fall and the last but not least we also would like to see the strengthening uh, cash as a contingency means of uh, payment instrument so whenever there is a problem with uh, cashless means of payments uh, cash also serves as contingency very important uh, here on the side of acceptance of cash uh, which uh, <clears throat> is uh, equally important there is a cooperation with the European Commission and there is also a newly set up expert group dealing with the legal tender so here what is important that this group should really also make a stock take of uh, let's say different perspectives of legal tender in the euro area member states and to see if there are additional actions needed to safeguard legal tender of cash as you may know I mean there are countries in which cash acceptance is very strict and it's defined in the law whereas there are also other types of countries where contractual freedom overrules uh, let's say legal tender and it can be that once parties agree uh, cash may not be accepted so for example if you have a sticker at the door uh, of the shop saying we don't accept cash this is considered as part of the agreement and now 
this special group will look into it and say, okay, is there a need to safeguard more the legal tender status of euro banknotes or not? So again, very interesting outcome to be expected. Moving to the next slide. Um, here we speak about the next generation of uh, euro banknotes. Of course, this is not uh, the topic of today because it was only recently that we have introduced the second series uh, euro 100 and 200. But of course, we already now have to think, okay, what should, um, what should we do in terms of uh, design of new banknotes? Do we need new themes? Do we need new, new designs? Uh, what the public thinks about our banknotes? Because uh, that is very important. So here, a dedicated group again has been set up to already consider uh, what is needed uh, in this field. And at the same time, next to the themes and design, we're trying to think of new features uh, which uh, could, let's say, make use of the state-of-the-art technologies and so on. For example, NFCs to check some of the features. And at the same time, not only speaking about security features to check the authenticity, but also to have a look at different substrates that would increase um, the lifetime of the new series banknotes. And last but not least, uh, if we move on to the next slide, we also need to have a look at the environmental footprint. So one of the goals is to decrease the environmental footprint of euro banknotes, not only speaking about producing them, but to have a look at the whole cash cycle and also find the ways where the footprint is highest and the ways how to decrease it. Uh, from the previous studies, it was clear that uh, next to the production in the cash cycle, the the highest uh, footprint or maybe CO2 part of it was with ATMs and with uh, transportation. So we are also having a look at this part. And our uh, approach is based on, let's say, the commission, the, um, sorry, methodology uh, developed by the European Commission called environmental footprint, which is a generic one. So you can use it for all different kind of products. And we are using this for, for banknotes. And uh, then, of course, later on, we would like to extend it from banknotes to coins as well. Um, important things before we move on to the final slide is that the Cash 2030 strategy has been approved by the Eurosystem uh, before Corona hit us. And the question was, once uh, since uh, March 2020, OK, uh, what do we have to do now with Corona? Has it changed our priorities? And to what extent do we need to, let's say, uh, prioritize certain things? And the quest, the answer to this question is on the final slide uh, in which we move on. Uh, OK, the pictures are a bit small. Apologies for that. But basically, what we have seen with Corona is that uh, still people who even preferred paying cashless they consider very important to have cash payment as an option. So even if they don't use cash for majority of their transactions, they deem uh, cash as a pay as an payment option very important. The second aspect was, OK, uh, how easy it is for the people to get cash, to access cash. And there we use our uh, two studies conducted in 2016 and 2019, in which we've seen by comparing them that uh, the percentage of people who have found it difficult to access cash in this three years period has increased uh, to 10%. So this is also a signal that one out of 10 persons willing to pay in cash have difficulties to access cash. And last but not least, uh, the impact study that we conducted in July 2020 uh, that was basically a study focusing on how COVID pandemic changed the, pay the payment behavior in the euro area, revealed that 40% of the respondents uh, would want to pay less with cash or to, um, a bit less or really a lot less. And this was a trigger for us. OK, I mean, what does it mean? What does it mean for keeping the cash infrastructure in a vit vital or vital conditions? So all these things together have triggered the Eurosystem focus on access and acceptance of cash. Uh, so we are really dealing with this topic uh, uh, this year and next year. 
and uh, hopefully we will be able to let's say um, come up with uh, certain recommendations for the future um, this brings me to the end of my presentation so thank you very much for the opportunity and I'm uh, happy to answer any questions you may have great thank you so much Joseph um, a lot of I mean you covered so many topics in such a, a short period of time well well done on that um, there I feel like there's there's so many areas we could we could probe on and I'm sure we will fill the agenda um, both in Washington and at our, our cash cycle seminar in Amsterdam with with a lot of these especially the access to cash and payments topics um, it seems to be a very very uh, timely topic all, all over the world and we know from work that we've done on forming a, a universal access to to payments group um, with with central with some central banks around the world it's just it's not just in Europe it's not just in the US it's it's all over the the world that access to, to cash and payments is definitely a, a hot a hot topic um, Michael I seen you unmuted do you have a, a question uh, ready to go there or would you oh, like no, to I, I, no? Yeah, okay. I, I, I would agree with what you said a lot a lot of really great information covered I, I guess maybe just one question uh, Joseph uh, on uh, the the importance of, uh, of people who, who are using cashless payments to still have cash as an option, was there a cost function involved in that uh, in that work that was done? Meaning, at any cost. So, for example, if cash usage has has declined substantially, uh, the infrastructure to support that li that little bit of cash would be very expensive. So, um, w was that considered in 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 the, in the comments they made, or is it uh, just a, a general comment that they made? Thank you, Michael. Uh, and a good question. So, I mean, I think it was a general comment of the people, and I think many of them have considered what happens when once cash is not there, once cash disappears, and could have been there could have been some examples where you can e easily increase maybe fees for cashless payments, for example. So, I believe that uh, people somehow understood, and the public on the respondents somehow understood that having variety of different options is basically also um, kind of denoting competition which is which is important here so I believe that uh, this was one of the drivers uh, for this answer but it was not backed up by let's say more a lot more explanations so thank you that would be my guess yeah and just 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 one other quick question so in in the US um, this has not happened at a federal level. Um, but at state levels, some states have gone ahead on this legal tender issue uh, and implement, implemented state laws that prohibit companies from not accepting cash. And I wonder in the Euro system, do individual countries have that authority to do already Is such legislation in country or would that be more of a uh, ECB initiative? Yeah, thank you. And this is this is one of the best questions that we really try to solve. Uh, in theory, I mean, any monetary considerations or a monetary law is with the euro system. Um, that means, I mean, you, the euro system, uh, with the rulings of the European Court of Justice, is basically the one to say um, about cash and its, and its, uh, let's say, um, um, the right of people to to use cash for for transactions. Of course, um, this has been backed up by the recommendation that normally you should be able to use cash and just having a signposting at the shop uh, is not enough. But at the same time, uh, in many of the jurisdictions, you have, uh, let's say, contractual freedom that overrules this. And especially for this, and I'll also to address your questions, uh, the LTEC group, so the professionals are now meeting together to decide whether there is a need to do something at the euro area level that would be then applicable for all the countries because uh, the situation in individual countries really varies. Yeah, thanks Thanks for those comments. Uh, just maybe one or two um, quickly from the audience and I know we're, we're running on on time for our last two speakers. So um, we'll also take some of the comments we didn't get to and try to get some answers out, out to folks afterwards. But um, in the crypto space, uh, we've, we've talked a, a bit about that and but in in that crypto world, do you see any effect of cryptocurrency on cash use, um, Joseph? <laughs> I mean, 
what, what we are trying to collect from the surveys is really the impact of different uh, means of payments and uh, cryptocurrency used for transaction is in let's say relative terms not that widespread compared to cards debit credit cards smartphones smartwatches so i i tend to say that so far it hasn't been a real let's say competitor to cash and cards which are the most used uh, payment instruments in the euro area uh, it depends uh, of course for the future uh, how they will be widespread and supported by the legislation uh, but currently i don't see cryptocurrencies as a real let's say um, rising cashless means of payments that will compete hardly with these uh, established ones yeah makes sense um, and how about uh, everybody's well, I don't know if it's a, a favorite topic or not but brexit um, any <laughs> what are you seeing in terms of effect on on banknote euro banknote use there uh, the brexit has not I would say influenced the cash activity cash activity as such um, of course uh, we are also now closely following the de uh, evolution of uh, let's say what what the UK is doing in terms of access uh, ensuring access and accessibility accessibility of cash and they have some nice uh, proposals that have been recently published for consultation for example using more of cash by cash in shop transactions to widen the cash access points and so on but uh, on the cash use i don't think that the brexit has really um let's say changed our figures it remains to be seen how it will affect the wholesale business uh with with uh, the uk which is not yet clear but i mean so far we haven't seen any special waves uh, in the circulation Okay, great. And maybe just um, one question if we could, I don't think we'll have time to bring the whole panel back up, but maybe if we could pop Alex, sorry, I hope you're ready, Alex. Um, Alex, back up for a, a second. I just have a question. You mentioned wholesale notes. Um, I'm just curious, both from the, the Fed and uh, if you have anything else to add on that, uh, Joseph, just has there been an effect on the wholesale distribution of notes over the past uh, year or so with, with COVID or what, what are you seeing? Yeah. Uh, you want to go first? Lisa? No, no, no. Please go ahead. Okay. And then this was related to international demand. Yeah, um, I think. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, um, it has been interesting. We we have seen um, a, a more subdued international demand for for uh, U.S. currency. Um, it doesn't mean that it totally dried up, but the the interesting thing that we've been um, looking at, and it, and it always is just an estimation, is the the breakdown of domestic versus. Uh, international um, holdings, or sorry, not um, holdings, but just how much might be estimated to be out there domestically versus internationally. And while there was less demand internationally, the fact that domestic demand, especially for the higher denoms, um, increased so dramatically meant that we really did see that shift from about you know two thirds um, being held internationally um, in terms of value to about, I think it's a little bit over 50%. So. It is a couple different things that, that we're monitoring there. And we also know that demand for U.S. currency internationally can depend on, you know, a variety of factors or events that are happening. So, you know, it's not that we necessarily think that this is uh, um, the the signals of a, of a large scale shift versus just, you know, the, the effects of, of how the pandemic played out. So um, it is something that, that is interesting that we um, continue to, to look at and monitor. Um, but just knowing just how quickly international demand for U.S. currency can spike means that we, you know, it's not going to necessarily um, be um, a, a permanent, um, you know, shift that that we've seen. So if I may add, I mean, <clears throat> we have had similar experience. I mean, when we had the first signs of, of the pandemic, March, April, We've seen a lot of banknotes uh, leaving the euro area via international, uh, let's say, wholesale business. Uh, and then it's stabilized and now uh, it's more or less flat, so it's not really going up and down. Um, what we also see is that the turnover is lower. So, I mean, the notes exported and imported um, uh, when compared to the pre-COVID periods are a lot lower. But also, this has something to do with the rather subdued traveling activity, for example, and, and the lockdowns, because uh, in the banknotes can, uh, can let's say, flow um, to, to um, yeah, 
Southeast uh, Europe, for example, uh, uh, via money remittances and so on, which is now, let's say, not 100% uh, revived after the COVID. So it remains to be seen, I believe, that again, the turnover will increase once we will be lifting all these restrictions. Great. Thank you for, for that. Okay, I know a lot of other questions came in. Um, we'll do our best to collect those and get some, some answers from folks and, and send them out. We'll probably update them in the LinkedIn uh, chat um, as, as we can. Uh, thanks, folks. But we have a couple other topics to, to get to. So I'd like to thank the entire panel, um, Ashley and Joseph and Alex, um, fascinating information as, as always, and expect to hear more from all of them at our upcoming events. So next, Michael, I'll kick it over to you to transition us here. Well, a person who needs no introduction, uh, a former uh, colleague of mine and certainly a longtime friend of mine, um, and uh, for quite some time now, the executive director of the International Association of Currency Affairs, otherwise known as IACA, uh, Ms. Ginny Foster. Ginny, please, we're all looking forward to uh, what you have to say here about the awards. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Sean. It's a real pleasure and a treat to be with you again, even virtually. And I certainly am looking forward to a time when we can meet again in person. Um, and thank you also to Currency Research today for giving IACA some time to talk about our plans for our 2022 awards uh, season. Uh, my IACA colleagues and I have actually been putting our heads together and discussing how we will proceed next year given the multitude of disruptions, both in the business and activities uh, uh, related to the pandemic. So next slide, Sean, please. And so just before I get into the details for 2022, please let me remind you a little bit about IACA, the organization. So IACA was founded nearly 15 years ago to bring together central banks and the other organizations in our currency community so that we can put our heads together and collaborate on the many issues that are a common concern to all of us. Um, at the present time, our organization is made up of 65 different central banks and uh, related organizations in the community, and we have almost 300 individual delegates. Over the years, we've worked together on many initiatives ranging from early opportunities to bring together central bank researchers interested in consumer bank uh, payments to collaborating on the development of guidelines for bank note production, ethics, and procurement issues. And we meet both in person in the past and virtually in order to sh share our experiences and ideas. We also have a library of materials as well as past conference presentations that's not available anywhere else to members of our community. And of course, we manage a variety of recognition initiatives. Next slide, please. So I hope you all will recognize that IACA is the program manager and the source of our IACA Excellence in Currency Banknote Awards that you generally see at the Currency Conference, our technical awards that we present in conjunction with currency research at the Banknote Conference, our coin awards that are presented at the Coin Conference, the Lifetime Achievement Award, and the IACA Currency Hall of Fame also in the past have taken place in conjunction with the Currency Conference. Uh, next slide, please. So given the disruptions of the past two years, in 2021, we actually have a special category of awards that recognize uh, best projects related to innovations uh, related to the COVID pandemic. So for 2022, we've had to decide how we will proceed, particularly given the joint venue of the Bank New Conference and the Currency Conference. So to that end, brrr, drum roll, here are the categories that we will be awarding in 2022. So we will be looking for nominations for best new circulating banknote or series, best new limited circulation or commemorative banknote, best new circulating coin, and best new currency innovations. 
So we are currently working on an update to our guidelines for our excellence in currency awards. And when they are ready, we will publish them on the IACA website well in advance of the period for accepting nominations. Uh, next slide, please, Sean. So this slide will show you our timeline for the 2022 awards. To me, it seems to be rushing at us quite quickly. So look for us to open the award nomination period through October of this coming year, 2021. After that, our awards committee will review the nominations and identify the finalists so that our IACA delegates will vote to determine the winners during November of 2021. And thanks to the support of Currency Research, we will have an in-person award presentation next year at the Joint Banknote and Currency Conference in February. Uh, next slide, please. But before we move right into 2022, please let me remind you that on September 23rd of 2021, at 12 noon GMT, we will have a virtual awards event where we will announce the winners of the special IACA uh, award categories for best currency initiatives implemented in response to the COVID pandemic. You'll have the opportunity to learn about eight fascinating pro projects that reflect a wide variety of different initiatives that may have been implemented in response to the pandemic, but in fact, present ideas for the currency community to go forward with in the future. So stay tuned for more announcements about that so you can register to watch the event. And we hope that many of you will join us then. Uh, next slide, Sean. So thanks to everyone for your attention today. And of course, to Currency Research for all of their years of support of our awards activities. I am looking forward to seeing many, many nominations of interesting projects in the categories I talked about uh, starting in October and to meeting in person with everyone in Washington in February. If you have, uh, it went away, but if you have any questions about our IACA Awards or about IACA more generally, please reach out to me and I'm sure you can you can find it on LinkedIn. My email is eugenie.foster at currencyaffairs.org. And thanks to Sean and Michael and over to you. Yep, sorry about that. Um, thank you, Jeannie. Uh, it was, we definitely look forward to having those awards at the, the Banknote and Currency Conference. Um, they're always a highlight, and we thank you for your for IACA's continued partnership and uh, great work on that. And we look forward to, to the awards season as we uh, roll into the fall. <laughs> it's coming fast. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it is. So thank you very much. Um, with that said, uh, we are going to move on to Donald with uh, Banknote Industry News, and they're going to Donald's going to give us an update on all things happening on his his end. So we, we look forward to that. Donald, if you want to introduce things, um, feel free to talk a little bit slowly while I pull up your deck. It will be okay. It will be thank up shortly. <laughs> thank you, thank you very much, Sean, and uh, uh, hello everybody. I hope you're doing fine in these difficult times, and it's an honor uh, to be in line with the. In the setup with the ECB and the Federal Reserve, and um, we would like to give you um, a short overview from uh, Banknote Industry News. We conducted a global survey with um, multiple central banks uh, worldwide about uh, cash perception in times of uh, COVID, and finally we got uh, the results um, from 36 central banks, which we would like to present you today. Um, so we can go to the first slide. Thank you very much, Sean. So do not see yet the presentation, Sean. On it. So yeah, no problem. So we are just to my my person. Um, so I'm Donald Schultz, managing director uh, of Banknote Industry News. We are global. Um, news company providing all the latest insights uh, from the industry um, many of you know us and uh, we have 
um, presented also recently the Banknote Technology Report, which I'm coming soon. So yes, thank you very much for this. And we can go straight into the first slide. Yes. So as said, we uh, conducted um, a global survey and um, I would like to give you the qualitative results uh, of uh, the 36 central banks, how cash is perceived in times of COVID. Thank you very much. We go to the next slide. Um, so the general perception is that, you know, if you if you can hear the media, you notice in some in some countries there were certain directions um, saying our oh, banknotes are not safe and they're transporting cert certain viruses and central banks had to act against it. And I think it's you could see also from the results what we gain from all the central banks worldwide in which countries really their medias more pushed it in a certain direction and in other one less. In general, we could notice that uh, nearly 70% of all central banks worldwide indicated that there's still a lot of trust and confidence in cash and it has not changed. While 25% stated it has decreased and this can be noticed that exactly in those countries where we could find a lot of media, a lot of also from, the, from other industries pushing this into a certain direction. Um, thank you and we go to the next slide. And also parallel to this, this one, we could notice that 67% of all central banks responded that banknotes are not disinfected in quarantine. And this is parallel in those countries where the people have really still a lot of trust and where the media is not pushing this and where still everything is fine. And the other ones where exactly it decreased, we could notice that those central banks also said, um, we are going to disinfect quarantine and quarantine notes and still doing this now when COVID uh, um, cases decrease slightly. And we can go to the next slide, please. Then it's all about a bit, you know, the discussion about is there composite or polymer or cotton-based substrate, which uh, it's a bit safer or better. Um, and the central bank has responded that 62% said that they do not see any really difference between um, these all these different excellent substrates for banknotes, which supporting the trust in it. 18% um, of central banks stated that composite and polymer-based substrate could maybe even further increase this confidence. Interesting also that from these 18% were already those ones where one denomination is already with composite or polymer in circulation and they said this could be further supported. Thank you very much. And we go to the next um, slide. Then um, we ask also um, what they would like to see and um, if maybe varnish new coatings could support this um, trust even further. And they said of all central banks which responded, 39% said new varnish coatings could improve further confidence in banknotes. We go to the next slide, please. And as as, you, as we have heard from all these previous uh, excellent presentations by the ECB and the Federal Reserve and also from Walmart is that in most of the countries, people tend in this pandemic situation to hoard um, and store um, higher denominations at home. And then we ask, is this maybe a tendency or they ask maybe for special security features and 30% of all the central banks responded, said that special security features could be interesting for those stored values, banknotes at home, and this one's maybe also higher denominations. And we go to the next slide, please. And then we had an open uh, question and ask, okay, what would you like to see in times, in these times of COVID and also afterwards? They, central banks would like to see an improvement in the cash handling process, um, make cash sustainable, reducing its environmental footprint. This is what we could see also from uh, the previous presentation by the ECB in which direction they're working. Durability of nodes, then new antibacterial varnishing, uh, what we can see now from Obertour, for example, with BioGuard, then also special equipment for sorting machines, which could disinfect the banknotes during the sorting process. process. And then in general, that the, um, the cost for the complete currency management, production, handling and process, if this can be reduced, that would be one of the targets uh, um, liked to see by central banks. 
So this was basically um, a short wrap up from our global central bank survey. And coming now to the next slide, please. So um, next to our inside news, which we are publishing around two times per week, we are also publishing uh, the Banknote Technology Report um, this year, already the seventh issue. And I think it's, if you can see already from the lineup uh, from all these leading um, currency suppliers, if you would like to have one report which brings you the compromise, all, all technologies and developments from all the leading suppliers together, then um, it's the Banknote Technology Report. Um, please ask for a free copy of it, no problem at all. So we have different segments this year. It's uh, the feature segments with Kurz, with uh, the new security threat uh, portfolio, Crane Currency, uh, with Motion, Rapid and the Priest. Then nanotechnology, uh, nanotech security. Then we have Krypton and also Hickfolian presenting the latest developments. On the printer side, um, there's more a comprehensive approach from Giesecke, who are offering uh, a Rolling Star I Plus, for example, a hybrid advance, for example. Then we have Oberteur uh, reporting exactly about their sustainability movement, which matching exactly what the ECB. Um, is requesting or firstly how they manage the COVID situation, note printing Australia, um, developing uh, a new security feature also for polymer. Then we have Delarue offering um, polymer substrate, but also um, the latest security features and the Bundesdruckerei. Then on the in technology, there is um, developing further um, new uh, security features. So if you would like to hear about it, um, Kleitzmann and Luminescence Sun Chemical. Uh, indicated some latest developments on the composite substrates. Very interesting, lung quad with Duracef, but also Bank de France. Maybe you were, you hear also lately about the cooperation also with Portals Paper. So very interesting about the latest developments. Then on the polymer substrate, CCL Secure with a new um, substrate on that. And also for the fibers and equipment, um, get the latest news from security fibers from the Komori, Hunkerle system about uh, destruction technology and also König and Bauer banknote solutions. And we're coming now to the next slide, please. And the good thing is, so in line to today's meetings, um, um, the best is you stay online for the next two days, 48 hours in a row, because tomorrow and on Friday, um, so if you want to hear really what's going on, what is the latest developments live from all leading um, suppliers in the industry, um, contact us. We have a webinar. It's a, with a free access uh, for the next two days, and you will. It's definitely something to watch. So thank you very much for this uh, opportunity. And are there any questions from your side? Thank you, Donald. That was, uh, as always, very fascinating stuff from the surveys that that you all do, and and the and the work of keeping on top of what's going on in the industry. So much going on, and I'm sure the next two days on your on your webinar are going to be um, extraordinarily interesting. So, I think uh, I don't think people have to stay on for 48 hours straight, right? They can they can just uh, come on every now and then. Yeah. <laughs> um, but no, uh, definitely sign up for those. They will be fascinating, and and also. Um, Please keep in mind that um, in in February we're also going to have Donald moderating a panel um, for us uh, at the Banknote and Currency Conference on all the all the developments and of new notes that are there that have occurred all over the world in the past uh, you know since we've gotten together last. So there's there's a whole lot going on, and we look look forward to that. Um, so no, I think uh, I think you covered a lot of topics there, Donald. Uh, again, very quickly, and I know you'll get into a lot more detail with the the suppliers on your your events. Yeah. So, thank you very thank, much for this, Sean. Thank you so much. Uh, we appreciate we appreciate your cooperation and time as always. Um, so that, uh, Mr. Lambert, I think we have uh, went through our agenda right on time, and. Uh, I don't know if you have any any comments uh, other than I just want to sign off by by thanking everyone for taking the time and uh, I can't wait to see everybody in in February. Uh, be on the lookout for an email from us uh, after this with a a special offer and thank you for for joining us um, that you can take advantage of at the at the event in February. Um, and also, please uh, keep in mind we have our Cash Cycle Seminar events as well as. Uh, well, those are coming up at the end of this year in November and December. 
um, in Amsterdam and San Diego. Uh, we look forward to seeing you there as well. And then we also have our Central Bank Payments Conference in, in Greece uh, coming up in early December, or sorry, early November as well. Um, so be on the lookout for information on all that. But, but Michael, I know we are just thrilled to get people together in Washington and, and see everybody's faces again. Yeah, for sure. I know. I know I am. Um, it'll be great to the extent that your central banks and yourself allow, allow yourself to travel. I think it'd be so, so wonderful to gather this, you know, a large group of people once again um, in support of our, of our, of our, um, of our business. And I know personally, I look forward to seeing a lot of you that I did not get a chance to see before I retired. So um, I, look to, I look forward to seeing you all there in February. And thank you very much to the panelists and thank you everyone who participated today. Thanks, Sean. Great. Thank you, everybody. Uh, hope to see you soon.